if you're taking notes today, the title of the message is Everyone Everywhere. Everyone Everywhere. And that will become apparent as we move our way through this. But I pray and I hope that your life just has Christ emanating from it. You know, we all know people who are the, a person that's kind of uh, defined by something else. You guys know somebody who maybe their whole life is given to a certain sport. And when you think of that person, you think of, oh yeah, he plays baseball or he plays football or soccer or something, or maybe it's a hobby or, a, or an instrument. Like, oh yeah, they love to play the piano or the guitar. I pray that by the time you guys walk out the door today, that you guys would be known as those people who bring Christ wherever you go. That every single one of you would take Christ everywhere you go. And so that's what we're going to learn from the Apostle Paul today. So why don't you guys stand up with me as we read 2 Corinthians chapter 2. So go ahead and stand. And I'm going to begin in verse 12. You guys can follow along with me. I'm going to read all the way down to the end of the chapter in verse 17. So let's read it together. He says, furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel and a door was opened to me by the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus, my brother, but taking my leave of them, I departed for Macedonia. Now, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one were the aroma of death leading to death and to the other, the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. Let's pray. Father, this passage today, if we can truly grasp it, every single one of our lives can be changed. And Lord, that's good. We're thankful that you've changed our lives. But God, you also desire to use us to bring the fragrance of Christ, the truth of the gospel to those around us. And so God, I pray that everyone in this room and everywhere they go, they would bring Christ with them. And I pray that today, if there's any students that are here and they've made their way here, maybe for the first time, or maybe they've been coming for their whole lives and they've not yet given their lives to Jesus Christ, they've not turned to you in repentance and faith, I pray that today would be the day, that the aroma would be life unto life. And so God, we pray that we would walk out of here a smelly people, not B.O., (laughs) not smelling like perfume or Axe body spray, but Lord, walking out of here with the very scent and fragrance of Christ so that those around us would be influenced for the gospel. God, only you can do this by your spirit. And so I ask that your spirit would teach us this morning in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. amen. So I think we've all had the experience, right, of walking into like a restaurant or a home and you smell what smells like food that has just come out of heaven. It smells like heaven's bakery has delivered to this house or to this restaurant. And as you smell it, even your body begins to react and your saliva begins to go in and and your appetite is whetted and you're like, oh man, like I want that. You guys all have that experience? Where you just walk in and you're like, oh, whatever it is, I want that. I don't know what I planned on having when I got here, but forget about that. I want whatever that is. It smells so good. But we've also, on the contrast, on the contrary, had the experience of driving down maybe a mountain road or a highway road and you pass by a skunk that is found in uncomely fate, right? And as you pass it, um, everybody in the car begins to kind of, like look at each other and like, hey, are we all getting the same thing? Um, Just this past week, my wife and I and the kids drove up to Oak Glen. And as we were driving, there was a very obviously freshly uh, deceased skunk on the road and, and we passed over it and as I was looking in the mirror, I had six eyeballs looking back at me, my, my, my daughters, and all of them slowly 
looked around the car and they looked at me and like, daddy, what is that? And I said, that, my love, is a skunk and it reeks, so stay away from them. And so we rolled the windows down to get the fragrance out. An aroma, an odor, a fragrance, it can be good or bad, as I just illustrated, depending on what it is and who it is that's smelling it. What Paul is going to do in our passage today is he's going to describe the Christian and the gospel as a fragrance that is perceived very differently by different people. For some, the gospel will be a fragrance that brings life. They hear the gospel, they see your life, and they want what you have. They want what Christ is offering, eternal life, freedom from sin. But this much is clear. There's also those that when they hear the gospel, it's like a fragrance of death. They want to roll the windows down and get the scent out of the car as fast as possible. They want you to stop talking about it. They want you to stop sharing it. And surely they would love for you to keep it within the walls of your home and your church. And so as we look at this, this much is very clear. The message of the gospel and the truth of Jesus Christ, it affects everyone everywhere. There's no way to get around it. In John chapter 12, Jesus spoke of this. In verse 32, he says this, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, Jesus is talking about when he'll be lifted up on the cross, right? As we just came through Passion Week and we saw that picture vividly on Sunday, Jesus said, if I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. Every person will be made to decide which side of the cross they're going to stand on. You guys remember when Jesus was crucified, there were two thieves, one on his left and one on his right. You guys remember that? There was one side that had a thief that became the converted thief because he looked at Jesus' death and he recognized, this is the son of God. Will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus told him, yes. Today you'll be with me in paradise. But then on the other side, there was the condemned thief. Every single person will be made to stand on one side of the cross, either with the converted thief or with the condemned thief. The cross brought about the message of life to this converted thief, but the cross was a reminder of a painful, excruciating death to the condemned thief. And so because it's been a couple weeks since we've been together, I want to bring you up to speed with where we're at in 2 Corinthians. And so by way of reminder, we're going to come to our text today. And as we come to our text, Paul is clarifying to the Corinthians why he didn't come to Corinth as he planned. You guys might remember if you were here a couple weeks ago, Pastor Joel taught that the Corinthians were quite upset with Paul because he had said he was coming, but then he ended up not coming through for them. So they thought. Paul's opponents, the false teachers and false apostles, said that he was fickle, that he was untrustworthy, or even that he was afraid to come to Corinth to face the music. But what Paul is going to go on to explain today in our text is that none of that was the case at all. And as we make our way through the text, you're gonna find that it was actually God who changed Paul's plans, not Paul who changed Paul's plans. And so if you're taking notes today, our first point is this, a wide open door. A wide open door. Paul is going to describe the reason for his delay is a door that had been opened to him by the Lord. Look at verse 12 with me. He says, furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel and a door was opened to me by the Lord. And so Paul initially goes to Troas to meet up with Titus who would bring him the report of how the Corinthians were doing. Paul wrote the the letter of 1 Corinthians. He sent it off. And then he wanted to send Titus to Corinth to see how they received the letter. Did they take his instruction? Did they take his rebuke? Did they take his encouragement? And so he sends Titus, and they were supposed to kind of have this rendezvous at at, uh, Troas. They were supposed to come back together at Troas, and Titus was going to update Paul. But while he waited on Titus, the Lord opened the door of the gospel. He opened the door for Paul to preach. Now, this wasn't the first time Paul was at Troas, but there's a evidence from Acts chapter 20 that Paul actually founds a church. He finds so much success preaching the gospel here at Troas. It's all going great. 
for Paul. But we're going to find out that even in the midst of awesome circumstances, Paul finds himself in a depressed state. But the, the reason Paul brings up this whole thing and, and the whole visit to Corinth is because that had become the chief issue among the Corinthians. They were upset that Paul said he was coming, but they didn't come. And so I want to look back at these verses that we went through about a month ago, but I want to look back at them because it'll bring us up to speed with where we're at today. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 5 through 7, Paul says this to the Corinthians. He says, now I will come to you when I pass through Macedonia, for I'm passing through Macedonia. And it may be that I will remain or even spend winter with you that you may send me on my journey wherever I go. But look at verse seven. For I do not wish to see you now on the way, but I hope to stay with you if the Lord permits. Paul had planned on coming and not only passing through, but Paul wanted to stay with them. Paul wanted to spend time with them and minister to them because he loved them. But that last phrase is very important. If the Lord permits. Paul recognized that he did not have all authority. He could make plans, but ultimately it was according to God's will. And so even earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 19, he says this, look. He says, I will come to you shortly. But notice what he says, if the Lord wills. So once again, Paul knew that God was in charge. This is a good thing for all of us to find out today. If you don't know this today and you're a believer in Christ, God is in charge. We can make plans. We can look to the future and those are good things. But at the end of the day, we need to be like the apostle Paul and say, if the Lord wills. Paul knew that even as he made plans that the Lord had the final say. And for this, for us today, this morning, and especially for you, as you go through this stage of life, this is a very good place for you to be. You have this temptation to look into your future and to make all these plans, and that's okay. You should be looking into what college you're going to go to. You should be looking into maybe a career that you're going to have one day. You should be looking forward to what it's going to take for you to live a successful life. That's absolutely necessary. But you also should have the asterisk next to every plan you make and every purpose you have if the Lord wills. Now, the reason this is so important is because this trip did not end up coming to pass. And so Paul is explaining why his plans changed. And it's important for you and I as well, because we all make plans that don't end up coming to pass. You guys ever had that happen? Yeah, we all have. Because you make plans to hang out and then someone gets sick, or you make plans to go on vacation and then something falls through. And so Paul was well aware that it was ultimately up to God's will. But the Corinthians didn't see it that way. They saw Paul as having made a promise and fallen through. And yet the whole way Paul said, hey, if God permits or if God wills, I'll come to you. And so why was Paul delayed? Why didn't he come? Well, it says that a door was open to him, that God opened a door for him to minister in Troas. He basically says this, he says, the Lord is the one who opened the door, and so it was God who changed my plans. That's what he says. And so he puts it back on the Corinthians and says, hey, God changed my plans. It wasn't my plan. My plan was to come and to spend winter with you. But God has opened up this door in Troas, and I have to minister here. Reminds me of Proverbs 16, 9. Many of you guys know this. If you don't, you should memorize it. But it says, a man's heart plans his way but the Lord directs his steps. You and I should be plan making plans in our lives. We should be planning for our future, but listen carefully. We must recognize that God has the final right and authority to override and change our plans. Ultimately, God has the authority, if you're a believer in Christ, to override and to change your plans regardless of how you feel about it. Why? Because you may plan your way in your heart, and that's okay. That's not sinful. But it's the Lord who's gonna direct your steps. And this may lead to disappointment or, or feeling left down, left, let out, let down or left out. <laughs> Say that one time slow. <laughs> but if God is in it, he's gonna work it out for his own glory. God is gonna put you right where he wants you so that he can use you as he sees fit. 
And so even though Paul knew this, and even though Paul knew that God had opened the door, there is this wrestling match that Paul is having. Because Paul wants to know how the Corinthians are doing. His love for the Corinthians and his lack of news from Titus caused Paul to have this internal turmoil that we see in verse 13. Look at verse 13. He says, I had no rest in my spirit. He just couldn't settle down. The church is going great. The ministry is going awesome. People are getting converted, but there's no peace, Paul says. And so it says there, I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus, my brother. But taking leave of them, I departed for Macedonia. The, the internal turmoil became so intense that he waited around and he was ministering, but it got to the point where he couldn't take it any longer. And so he left Troas in search of Titus. And this reminds me of, of a few different times that God has taken people from a very successful, fruitful ministry and moved them for one reason or another. It happened to Jesus You remember when Jesus went out to pray and his disciples came and said, hey, everybody's looking for you. And Jesus said, well, I need to go into the next town and preach. God took Jesus from what was an obviously fruitful ministry field and moved him somewhere else. Same thing happened to Philip as he was ministering with a brand new church, people getting converted. And God says, go to the desert, Philip. Why? Because there's an Ethiopian eunuch that needs to hear the gospel. And so God does this from time to time. And whether it was God's will for Paul to go to Macedonia or not, scholars argue. But at the end of the day, Paul finds himself going to Macedonia. He leaves a brand new growing church in Troas in search for Titus. Now, remember, the Corinthians actually believed all the accusations about Paul. But the reality is Paul is about to go into the darkest season of his ministry life because of his love for the Corinthians. We need to be very careful what we believe about the people that love us because it's so easy to believe what someone might tell you about someone else or the thoughts that you might have about, oh, they're doing this for this reason. When at the end of the day, we can't know the motives of people's hearts. And so these people, they thought they had Paul figured out. But really what was happening with Paul is he was putting himself through a meat grinder, spiritually speaking, because of his love for the Corinthians. And so in all of this, we see that God changed Paul's initial plans. But even then, even as God changed Paul's initial plans, it doesn't seem to work out the way Paul had hoped. According to 2 Corinthians 7, this move to Macedonia leads to one of the darkest times in Paul's ministry. Leads to one of the darkest times in Paul's life. He says so in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. He says, for indeed, when we came to Macedonia... Our bodies had no rest. That is physically they had no rest. He says, but we were troubled on every side. He said, outside were conflicts, inside were fears. He said, outside we had conflict everywhere we went and inside we were fearful day and night. And so the question is, was all of this a big waste? Was this open door that God gave Paul and Troas? Was this move to Macedonia? Was it all a big mistake? Did God mess up or did Paul mess up by going? What good could possibly come from this situation with Paul? Now, for you here today, this might hit a little close to home for you. You might say, yeah, that sounds a little bit like my life. I feel like outside I'm conflicted and inside I have these anxieties and these fears and this feeling of depression. There's been a change of plans. Everything was going good and then out of nowhere this happened. Or there's difficulties all around. If that hits close to home, then let's look at what Paul says next. Look at our second point in verse 14. He said, the second point is this, a triumphant life, a triumphant life. And now that point might kind of take you off guard. Like, wait a second, you were going in this direction, you know, difficulty and depression and fear and anxiety. And now you're going to talk about a triumphant life. Absolutely. Paul is going to describe the Christian life as a life of triumph and victory, not of defeat and disappointment. Listen carefully. If you are a Christian in this room this morning and you are living a life of disappointment and defeat, God wants to remove that and show you a life 
of triumph. That doesn't mean you're going to have a Mercedes Benz. If you do, that's cool for you. It doesn't mean you're going to get the perfect job. It doesn't mean you're going to meet the perfect person. It means that despite your circumstances, God is going to give you triumph because we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And so Paul, with the very first word of verse 14, changes the entire direction of what's going on. Look at that first word in verse 14. He simply says, now. I want to pause there for a second. Now. Paul turns the Corinthians' eyes, and this morning he turns your eyes and my eyes, away from his difficulty, away from his depression, and to God. Now, this is very good advice for all of us. If you're going through a season in your life where you feel down or depressed or low, you need to turn your eyes from your circumstances to the one who rules above them, that is God. And so that's exactly what Paul does here with that word now. He changes the direction of the whole study and he says, look at verse 14, now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. It almost seems like it's out of place, doesn't it? With the direction the the letter was going and now he says, thank God I'm always triumphant. Like what? Paul, you just said you were bummed because you couldn't find Titus and you had to leave a great ministry opportunity. What do you mean you're triumphant? Well, let's look at this a little bit more. I want you to notice that it says leads us in triumph. If you're a person who underlines, writes, circles, highlights in your Bible, underline, circle, or highlight that word us. Because it is significant, because we might be tempted to think, yeah, God always leads Paul in triumph. But Paul turns, and rather than saying leads me in triumph, he says leads us. So you could circle that word us, draw a little line next to it, and put me too. Why? Because if you're a Christian, he's going to lead you in triumph as well. He indicates that this is true for all believers. And so even though he's at an extreme low, He knows that in Christ and because of Christ, he will be led to victory in the end. Do you have this confidence in your life? That no matter what's happening, Christ is on the throne. Christ is in control. You can. You can have the very same confidence that the apostle Paul had. That when he despaired even of life itself, he could say, God's going to lead me in triumph. Let's look at this word triumph a little bit closer. The word triumph, it simply means to conquer, to give the victory, or to triumph over. But Paul is painting a very vivid picture for these first century Christians. It was actually a practice of the Roman government that when one of their generals conquered new land, that they would parade through the cities of Rome, and they would have musicians and captives They would bring the spoils of victory with the victorious troops and priests bearing incense. They would have an animal for sacrifice to their gods. And ultimately, at the end of this parade, they would have the general, the commander in chief. So I want you guys to strap on your leather sandals today and go back to first century Rome and stand on the side of the Roman road with me when the general has just conquered new land. And you're hearing the sound of music and celebration as they parade through the streets. And you see the captives being taken where they'll be imprisoned or put to death. You see the spoils of war. They're idols and and gold. It actually happened in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. They took the menorah and the golden table and the, the little incense altar. And they brought those and they paraded them through the streets. Why? Because the Roman gods had triumphed over the God of Israel, so they thought. And so as they went, they would shout this. They would shout, lo, triumphe. So on the sides of the streets, the people would shout, lo, triumphe, as they went through. And all of this was painting the picture of victory, of them conquering the enemy. And at the end of the day, when it was all said and done, the general received a new title. He was no longer a general. He's no longer a commander. He was called the triumph. That's what he was called. And so Paul takes this image that they all knew so well. They all knew of this practice. And he says, Jesus is the true triumph. Jesus is the one that leads his people to victory. 
And so even though Paul is going through this difficult and demoralizing season, even though he's going through these horrible circumstances, Paul saw himself in the procession marching with the true triumph of heaven, Jesus Christ. And so he removed himself from the difficulty of the moment and recognized that Jesus is the true triumph. We see this in a couple places in the New Testament. I'll have it on the screens for you guys. But the first one is in Colossians 2.15, where Paul uses the exact same word to paint the picture of Jesus triumphing over principalities and powers. That through the death on the cross and the resurrection, Jesus took the principalities and powers, the devil and the demons and the fallen angels and all of them, and he's led them captive through the streets. Now, listen to this, because it's a beautiful picture when you think about it. Think of this Roman triumphal procession and Jesus has these demons and these, uh, the devil himself chained, leading him through the streets, putting him to shame, showing I have triumphed over my enemies. It's a beautiful picture. In Romans 6, we see that Jesus triumphs over the power of sin in the believer's life. That sin no longer rules over you. Rather, Jesus rules over you. And he's given you freedom from sin. And lastly, but not least, as we saw this past week, in Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, it says that Jesus triumphs over the fear of death and even death itself. So that Paul knew in the back of his mind that Jesus has triumphed over the fallen entities of this world, the principalities and powers. Jesus has triumphed over sin in my life and Jesus has triumphed over death so that no matter what comes to me, Jesus has triumphed over it. And he reigns victorious. And because we're with him, we get to march as well in the triumphal parade. And so in Jesus' victory over these things, we get to march with him. This is all summed up very well in Romans chapter eight, verses 35 and 37. Paul gets to the end of this chapter and says this. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now he gives a, a pretty, pretty gnarly list here. Look at this. He says, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Skip down to verse 37. He says, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Paul says, it does not matter what comes upon me in my life because I'm with him, the triumph, Jesus Christ. And he has made you and I more than conquerors through him who loved us. Because of what Jesus has done, because of his work on the cross, and because we belong to him, we, like Paul, are more than conquerors through him, regardless of what's going on in your life right now. If you're a Christian living a defeated or depressed life, bummed out by your current circumstances, it's time for you to look to the triumph, Jesus Christ, and cry out, Lo, triumphe. Get in the parade and march with Jesus and the Apostle Paul. Which brings us to our third point, which is this, a powerful witness. A powerful witness. Witness. Now we see that we actually have a part to play in this. We've joined in with Jesus in this triumphal parade, but we're not supposed to just be passive onlookers. You and I have a part to play because wherever Paul ended up, God used him as a witness to tell others about Jesus Christ. At this point in Paul's life, we may have asked him, hey, Paul, are you bummed that God led you to Macedonia? where you found this great difficulty, where you've been so depressed that you even have said you've despaired of life? Are you bummed about that? I think Paul would have responded in hindsight, no. Because God desires to use everyone everywhere. If you're a Christian here today, God desires to use you right where you're at, even in the midst of difficult circumstances. And so let's look at these two aspects of being a powerful witness. Let's look at the first one, which is this, a powerful witness in every place. Paul says that wherever he went, he brought the knowledge of Jesus with him. Look at verse 14. The second half of verse 14 says this, and through us, that is through believers, God diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Continuing his illustration from the triumphal procession, he's going to focus in on just one aspect of it. The incense that the priests 
carried. That as they marched through, the priests would burn incense to their gods. And what would happen is there would this be this potent and sweet smell that would remind everybody of the victory that had been won. And so as this line of priests would walk through and they'd swing their incense altar things back and forth and the smoke would waft into the air and it would permeate the entire city, the entire block. That's the way Paul wanted to be with the gospel. Paul wanted to be that way everywhere he went. He sought to diffuse the fragrance of the knowledge of Christ, whether it was Ephesus, whether it was Troas, whether it was Macedonia, whether it was Corinth, whether it was Chino or Chino Hills or Corona or Norco or wherever the rest of you guys live. (laughs) He wanted to take the fragrance of Christ with him wherever he went. Let's look at these two words a little bit closer where he says he diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge. These two words, diffuse and fragrance, are very uh, applicable. They're easy words to see with your mind. The word diffuse, it simply means to appear, to declare, to reveal, or to make clear. It's really just to put it out there for everybody to see, and it makes it very clear. The word fragrance, it simply means fragrance or odor. That word fragrance is used in John chapter 12, verse three, when Mary anointed the feet of Jesus, it said the whole house was filled with the fragrant oil. I think we've all experienced a a man or woman wearing too much perfume or cologne. You guys experienced that? Yeah, you guys chuckle and I see you guys nodding. It almost seems like there's a cloud that follows them, doesn't it? Almost like Pigpen from the Peanuts. You know how as he walks around, that dust cloud follows him wherever he goes. If he like hits something, like the dust like goes on that thing. That's how it is when people wear too much cologne or too much perfume. Where even if you just give him a quick hug and then back up, it's on you, it's too late. That's just what you smell like. All right, maybe you guys, during Christmas time, you show up a little late, but Aunt Betty was there before you. And Aunt Betty's notorious uh, for having too much perfume on. If you show up hours later, that house is still gonna smell that way. Why? Because the fragrance has permeated the house. Now, we can laugh at those kind of silly examples, but the reality is that Paul wanted to be that way. Not with Axe body spray, (laughs) not with cologne or perfume. Paul wanted to diffuse the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. He wanted to take the knowledge of Jesus wherever he went. And so as believers, this should be our aim. Through thick and thin, ups and downs, good and bad, easy and tough, we should always be looking for an opportunity to represent Christ and share the knowledge of Christ wherever we go. Of course, this would include the way we live our lives. We should live our lives in a way that people recognize that when we tell them we're a Christian, they're not shocked. (gasps) You? Oh, I never would have thought you were a Christian. We should live our lives in a way that shows the gospel, but of course we should look for uh, opportunities and open doors to share the truth of the gospel with others as well. And so let's look at the second aspect. The first one is every place. Let's look at the second aspect, a powerful witness to every person, to every person. In the same way that the witness of the gospel is to go into every place, it also goes to every person. We talked about this a little bit in the introduction, but look at verse 15. He says, for we are to God, the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. God uses our life and our witness for Christ as a fragrance of Christ to the world. There are two responses to this fragrance. There are those who are being saved and those who are perishing. So let's look through those two quickly together. The first one we're going to look at is those who are perishing because those are the first one that Paul talks about in verse 16. Look at the first half of 16. He says, to the one, we are the aroma of death leading to death. That doesn't sound very fun, does it? Paul points out there are some that don't want Christ. They don't want the gospel. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to believe it. To them, the gospel smells like death. They would be those that pass that skunk 
on the side of the road and the smell gets into the car and they roll down their windows and say, get that out of here. But they're not doing it with the smell of a skunk. They're doing it with the words of eternal life. That when they hear the gospel, they, as it were, roll down their windows and say, I don't want to hear it. Get it out of my face. You guys might have family members like that. You guys might have friends like that. That when they, even you just bring up something about church or something about God, stop preaching to me. I don't want to hear it. It's the aroma of death leading to death. John Phillips paints a great picture here. I wish I could write one paragraph like this paragraph I'm about to read to you. It's very good. Look at what it says. He says, there is a mystery here. We see in nature one person can pick some flowers and revel in their sweet fragrance. When another person begins to sneeze, his eyes water, his nose runs, his chest tightens, he's allergic to them. What is a delightful fragrance to one is a deadly fragrance to the other. So it is with the fragrance of Christ. With the exact same message, with the exact same gospel, there are some who revel in it and rejoice in it, and there's others who it's as if they've just inhaled something they're allergic to, their eyes begin to water, they begin to sneeze, their chest tightens, they can't stand it. Think back for a moment to the triumphal procession that I told you guys about earlier. That pervasive smell of the incense was, was a beautiful smell to some people. But to the captive troops, to the enemies that were captured, this aroma that they couldn't get out of their nostrils was the reminder of death. And that's the picture that Paul is painting here. We see this pretty vividly in Acts chapter seven. In Acts chapter seven, verse 54, Stephen had been preaching uh, to those who were uh, really responsible for the Lord's death, for those who had arrested him, for those who had turned him over to the Roman government. And so as he's preaching to them, he gets to the part where he talks about Jesus. I'm sure they were all in agreement as he talked about the patriarchs, about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David. He talked about all the patriarchs, all the Old Testament. And they were like, yeah, amen, preach it. And then he gets to Jesus. And look how they respond. In verse 54 it says, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. I want to stop there for a moment. Because when someone hears the gospel, conviction takes place. And this conviction is going to drive them in one of two directions. This conviction is going to drive them to anger or it's going to drive them to the cross. Because they recognize they need to be forgiven of their sins. And so let's look at how they respond with this conviction. It says they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. They cried out with a loud voice. They stopped their ears and they ran at him with one accord. They cast him out of the city and stoned him. When they heard the gospel, when they heard the message of eternal life, they literally plugged their ears like children, screamed at the top of their lungs, grabbed him, threw him out of the city and killed him there. That's how they responded to the gospel. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians 8, uh, 1 18. He says, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. And for these who heard of the cross, who heard of the Lord, it was a foolish message. So foolish that the man Stephen deserved to die. There are those who simply do not want Christ and to them, Paul's life and gospel smelled like death. And I just want to give you a heads up. If you're a Christian in here today, be ready. This will happen to you as well. There's only a matter of time until you go to share with somebody and they're going to say, stop, I don't want to hear it. Why? Because the fragrance of Christ to them is death leading to death. But it's not all bad because there are also those who are being saved. Look at verse 16, again, right in the middle. He says, to the other, the aroma of life leading to life. So in contrast to those who reject the gospel and the smell of death, there are those who are being saved where the fragrance of Christ actually brings life to them. They hear it and they're like, that's exactly true. That's exactly right. I need that in my life. I want it. Those are those who are described by Romans 1.16. Romans uh, 1.16, you guys know it well, I'm sure. But he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. 
Why? Because the gospel of Christ is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For those who hear the gospel and they recognize their need and they believe in Jesus for salvation, they're not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it's what brought them to life. They knew they were dead in their sin and the gospel brought them life. And so within the gospel, we see the power contained to save lost humanity and reconcile lost sinners to God. And ultimately, this is what makes the reaction to the gospel so strong in both directions. Because you might wonder, what, what is the big deal? Why do people get so upset about the gospel? Well, ultimately, it comes down to this. Some people are enraged to find out that they're sinful, they're lost, and they're currently under the judgment of God. That is ultimately what causes them to be so upset. And what they do is they lash out when conviction comes like those did in Acts chapter 7. They turn away from God and they run. But then there's others, those who are coming to life, that they know and they're convinced that they have sinned and offended a holy and righteous God. But rather than running from him, they run to him asking for mercy and for grace and for forgiveness. And we know that those things are all found in the cross alone. Now, we shouldn't be surprised by this because Jesus said in John chapter 3, verses 19 through 21, something very similar. Look at it with me. In John chapter 3, verses 19 through 21, Jesus says, this is the condemnation. Jesus says, this is the reason people are going to go to hell, ultimately. That light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So often what's ups what upsets people about the gospel is that the gospel is speaking against the things that they enjoy in their life. The sinful desires and pleasures of their flesh that they don't want to give up. And so because they love their darkness, because their deeds are evil, they will not come to the light. And so in verse 20, he talks about those who are perishing. Look at what it says. He says, for everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. See, again, it's connected to what they do and what they enjoy. And so often when you get down to the very base level, those who reject the gospel do not reject it for intellectual reasons. They don't reject it because they believe in science. No. They reject it because they enjoy living their life unhindered by God. But then in verse 21, he talks about those being saved. Look at what it says. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they've been done in God. Those who recognize that what God has says is true, they come to God. I trust many of you have even today. Peter says something very similar because you might be sitting here thinking, huh, am I one of those that have the aroma of Christ death unto death or life unto life? Well, Peter gives us a way really to test ourselves in 1 Peter chapter 2, he says, therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. Who? Jesus. He says, for those of you who believe, Jesus is precious to you. So let me ask you a question. Is Jesus precious to you? That when you think about Christ, is it an aroma of life unto life? Is it like that restaurant that you've walked into that you're like, oh, I could live here. It smells so good. Or is it like that skunk that you've passed on the road? that you just want to get it out of your face. You just, you don't want to think about it. In all of Paul's disappointments and difficulty, even through a season of depression, he found that he had an opportunity to live as a witness for Christ to everyone, everywhere the Lord sent him. We, you and I, as believers in Christ, we have the same opportunity. We have the same opportunity and would to God that our, our lives would emanate Christ and his gospel as we expectantly wait for him to open doors. Now, you might be sitting here and you might be something like me and you might be seeing that reality of representing Christ everywhere I go all the time. Is that even possible? Can I even do that? Is that something that someone can actually do? Well, that leads us to our fourth and final point, which is this, an encouraging reality an encouraging reality. It doesn't matter how long you've been a believer. There always seems to be some hesitation or some intimidation that comes when you're witnessing for Christ. 
Here we see that it was even experienced by the Apostle Paul. That when the Apostle Paul looked at this standard of being a fragrance to the lost world of the love and the saving power of the gospel, Paul's like, is that even possible? Look at what he says at the end of verse 16. He says, who is sufficient for these things? There's almost a digression there where he's talking about the fragrance and the the people being saved and they're coming to life. Then he pauses. But who, who can do that? The word sufficient, it means competent. It means able. It means to be enough for, sufficient, worthy. What Paul's saying, who's really competent or able to live life this way? Now, we're gonna talk about this more next week when we get into chapter three. Paul is going to talk about how our sufficiency as Christians and in ministry comes from Christ, but we'll save that for next week. For this week, I wanna talk about three aspects of a life that God will bless with opportunities to witness for Christ. Those three aspects come from verse 17. Look at it. He says, we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. Paul says that he, as he lives and ministers, he does these three things. The first thing is that he does not do it for selfish gain. He's not looking for money. He's not looking for status. He's not looking for followers. He's not peddling the word of God. The word peddling, it means to bring to the marketplace and sell again. It means you purchased it low and you want to take it to the marketplace and sell it high. Why? To make money. He said, we're not doing that. He says, we're doing it from a sincere heart. That's the second thing, a sincere heart heart. His heart is sincerely desiring to be pleasing to God. And I would say that's another way you can test yourself this morning. If you wonder, am I really a Christian? Am I really in the faith? Am I really born again? Is your heart to be pleasing to God? Yeah, yeah, but we all have those things that we fall short in. Yes. But is your heart, is your aim at the end of the day, at the bottom line, is it to be pleasing to God? That's what Paul says. He says, I have a sincere heart. I just want to be pleasing to God. And the third thing he says is in the sight of God. Simply means right before God. Right in front of God. He knows everything he does is being watched over by God for good and for bad. And so because these three things are true in Paul's life, he knows God will be with him. He knows that God will give him the power to do the things he's called him to do. You and I should be encouraged by this because we are like the apostle in more ways than we might recognize. Paul knew his own weakness. Do you know yours? I know mine. I know my own supreme, awesome, and amazing ability to mess things up, and so do you. But God will use us who are not in it for selfish gain, who are true to the scriptures with a sincere heart. He'll use your life. God will bless that kind of ministry wherever you are, wherever you are and wherever you go. And so as we close, I want to point back to the the Roman triumph one more time. Because Paul used the picture of the Roman triumph and diffused incense to point out to the Corinthians that even when things may not be going according to plan, Jesus will be victorious in the end. And that Jesus will use our lives to bring him honor and glory. And so right now, where are you? Now, I don't mean church. I know some of you guys were about to say church. I'm at church. That's not what I mean. When I say, where are you? I'm saying, where are you in life? Are you in a place like Troas where everything seems to be going good, but there's no rest in your heart? Are you in a place like Macedonia where nothing seems to be going good? There's depression, anxieties, fears, and they're all around and they're tempting you to, to go in that direction. Where are you in life? What open doors has God given you there to be an incense and a fragrance for Christ? And are you diffusing the knowledge of Christ there? Are you using the place where you're at in your life right now as your gospel ministry, as your opportunity to let others know about the love of Jesus Christ in coming to save and reconcile lost humanity? God desires to use everyone everywhere so that all would come to know the true triumph, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, God, I bring you
these students here today because for those who know you and those who are walking with you, Lord, their heart is like the Apostle Paul. They want to be well-pleasing to you. And so, God, I pray, Father, that in the sincerity of their heart and the truthfulness of their lives, God, that you would use them. That they would be playing the part of the, the priest in the parade, just diffusing the knowledge of Christ everywhere they go, be it school, be it, for many of them, at home amongst family members and friends, sports and hobbies. God, when they go to the mall, the movie theater, God, wherever you take them, may their lives emanate Christ. God, and may you use them to share the gospel with so many people. May they just see Jesus in them and hear Jesus from them. And God, I also want to pray is, in this season of their life, they're looking towards the future. They're looking at what college they're going to go to. They're looking at different things, what career they're going to have, where they're going to live. Father, may they recognize, like the Apostle Paul, that all their plans, though they may plan them with their heart, you are the one who will direct their steps. God, you faithfully took Paul and you brought him to Troas and you opened up a glorious door for them. And that was... For a door for him, and that was just for a time. God, I'm encouraged because in Acts chapter 20, he goes back to Troas and has a very fruitful ministry there once again. And God, you're so faithful to lead us right where we're supposed to be, right at the right time. And so God, for any here that are embarking on a new journey in life or there's been a sudden change of plans and maybe their whole life is being flipped upside down, God, may they have the confidence that you are the true triumph and that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. The key is not us. The key is the general, the triumph, Jesus Christ. And so God, may we keep our eyes firmly fixed upon you and upon your death and resurrection on the cross for us because by that you've overcome the principalities, powers, you've overcome sin, you've overcome death, Lord, and you will overcome for us. And so God, as we wait, may you use us to diffuse the knowledge of Christ in every place to everyone. In Jesus' name, amen.